The Proctor Maple Research Center was established as the first permanent maple research facility in the United States. The scientists and researchers who began their work here in 1946 were pioneers, establishing standards and setting grades that continue to impact the maple industry. Quantity. And over 60 years later, there are still pioneers working at Proctor Maple Research Center. People have been interested in trees that you put holes in and sap comes out for a really long time. So we're Vandenberg isn't trying to be flip to or sassy. In fact, her latest project puts her in almost the exact same place as her scientific forebears, with one big exception. She's tapping birch trees. And if that sounds a bit off, how about this? She's not even sure when to tap. We have no idea when to tap birch trees, none. It's, <laughs> it's really, there are a lot of really simple questions like that that we don't have good answers to. If maple syrup is considered a niche or a specialty product, then birch syrup is a niche of a niche of a specialty product. Out of the tree, birch sap looks exactly like maple sap. And like maple, birch syrup is used as a sweetener. And that's where these two similar saps sugar off and go their separate ways. Birch tends to be a little darker, um, but it is brought up to approximately the same density that maple syrup is. So it has a lot of the same look, um, but has a very distinct um, flavor that really, you know, is nothing like maple syrup. So it's um, really not appropriate to compare the two. They're really, you know, they're sweeteners, but they're two very, very different uh, products in themselves. So they might look a little of the same, but they, they really don't taste the same at all. Most of the world's birch syrup production comes from Alaska, and the supply is limited, which is one reason Vandenberg is interested in tapping into this market. Right now, the price for bir pure birch syrup is about $74 a quart. Um, so it's a very valuable commodity, um, both because of its limited supply and also uh, because it is, it's very difficult to produce in general to, and pr to produce well. And the demand for it is particularly heavy in the international markets. Then there's also the local food market. It's the local chefs that really want the product. So if this really goes forward, it would really re require some work to kind of develop those markets and foster those both of those types of markets to make sure that it's a product that people would buy in a you know, once we start producing it. Marketing birch syrup is putting the cart before the horse. Until then, Vandenberg and her colleagues need to solve the minor problem about when to tap. This tree here is, is one of our test trees. We've learned from other people who produce birch syrup that in order to get the most out of each tree, you need to tap it just at the right time. In maple, you're able to hedge a little bit, tap early, and not really uh, lose out on the, the total production. With birch, it's, it's important to get it just right. So we have a number of trees that we tap just to watch the sap flow and to see when it was really running. And when the majority, about 75% of those test trees are running, then we were able to start our experiment. So far, researchers have determined that birch sap starts to run about the time sugar maples have stopped running. The purpose of this study investigates if sugar makers in the Northeast could diversify their operations after the maple sugaring season. Sugar makers would essentially switch their taps from maples to birches. So we are tapping a set of 40 birch trees of tappable size and a range of diameters and collecting the sap from them and measuring that sap to determine what is the volume of sap that is collected from each of those trees. And we also measure their sugar content. So at the end of the season, we can calculate the average quantity of sap and sugar that is able to be harvested um, from birch trees in our operation. So then we'll then use that average yield to do some economic calculations to determine, okay, given an operation with a certain number of birch trees and a certain functioning of their maple operation, certain equipment, et cetera, how many birch trees would you have to have in order to make birch syrup production a profitable venture? This research is funded by the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. What Vandenberg and her funders are banking on is that modern sugaring technology, like reverse osmosis, which concentrates the sugars in the sap, will increase the amount of birch syrup that can be produced. 
On average, the sugar content of maple sap is about 2%. Birch sap tends to be about half that, and often even less. Vandenberg estimates that it could take at least 100 gallons of birch sap to make one gallon of syrup. We really didn't have a way to make birch syrup profitably in the Northeast before. There, you know, the lower sugar content, the lower sap yields really just didn't make it, uh, you know, a winning proposition before. And so that is one of the reasons that it hasn't been, you know, the line of inquiry hasn't really been pursued that heavily before other than sort of just um, from a purely scientific standpoint, looking at why the pressure is produced and things like that. Um, so now we have these tools and techniques and technologies that enable us to say, well, perhaps we could make this a profitable venture. So, you know, all the resources that we've had developed from doing research in maple, we're able to apply that what we've learned to birch. This project is designed to study sap yields and correlate profitability, not make syrup. One of the hallmarks of applied science is that every answer generates 10 more questions. Like those researchers who came here in the late 1940s, Vandenberg and her colleagues are learning more than what they set out to do. We're kind of curious uh, as to exactly how and why birch trees are doing what they're doing. Um, it's a very, it's a different sap flow mechanism than maple. Um, a maple sap flow is based on a stem pressure mechanism. Birch sap flow is based on root pressure, so it develops in a different way. Um, so we are doing some measurements of the pressure inside birch trunks across the season, uh, but in both tapped and untapped birches, to see how the pressure develops and um, also trying to link that with air temperature and soil temperature and things like that, so that we can get a little bit of a better handle on exactly how pressure develops in birches that will kind of inform our decisions of, okay, so if we're going to tap birch trees, when is it best to tap them, uh, how early, how late, things like that. Some of those sort of management type questions that we'll need to eventually answer a little better than we know now um, if this turns out to be a profitable venture. Oh, wow. This monitoring station, built by researcher Mark Isselhart out of a cooler, keeps all the electronics warm and dry. His ingenious efforts are being rewarded with some new data that only Mother Nature has ever known. Trees that we have wired up for pressure and temperature are giving us readings of the internal pressure in the tree. And we know from um, the literature that the tree um, can develop quite high pressure, as high as 30 PSI or higher. What isn't well known is what the pressure is in a tree after it's been tapped. So we actually have a tree, several trees wired with sensors to measure the pressure in the tree. And we also have one that has a tap hole in it that we're collecting in a bucket. So we're able to get really for the first time what the pressure in the tree is when it has sap flowing out of it. It will be a while before the word birch gets added to the name of the Proctor Maple Research Center. For now, this research is strictly in the name of science. It all boils down to being very curious and interested in how trees work and what they do, how they do what they do, and sometimes why they do what they do. And this is just another piece of that, another um, problem or question under that umbrella that is really fascinating to look at and investigate. Maybe maple and birch aren't so different. After all, each of these trees has been researched tested and studied for decades, and they have yet to yield all of their secrets. In Underhill, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence.